Good evening, friends, and a very warm welcome to the Tron Church tonight for our evening service and admission of new members. Let me read some words from Isaiah before we sing. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. We begin our service by singing together hymn number 177. God, we praise you. God, we bless you. God, we name you Sovereign Lord. Number 177. Let us bow our heads together and we'll turn to the Lord in prayer, further prayer. When the Apostle John was in exile on the island of Patmos, he had a great vision of the Lord Jesus in his glory. And as he looked up, he saw one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, and with a golden sash round his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. 
And John writes, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Our great and gracious Lord Jesus, we acknowledge the wonderful truth of John's vision and thank you for showing it to him all those years ago. And we thank you too, Lord Jesus, for showing us something of your majestic glory in these words as we think of what John himself was able to see on that wonderful day. And we thank you for showing to him and telling him in clear words that although you had died, you were and are alive forevermore, and in your hand are the keys of death and Hades. And dear Lord Jesus, we take these words to our great comfort and joy. We think of the way that the Bible, the Gospels, portray those few short years that you spent on the earth, We think not only of your birth at Bethlehem, but of the years of your public ministry when you trod the roads of Galilee and Judea, preaching and teaching, healing the sick and raising the dead, and giving to many people a glimpse, an insight of the nature of the world to come and of your power and truth. And Lord Jesus, even though your glory was almost entirely veiled for those few years. We thank you that you showed your apostles something of it. And we think of you, dear Lord Jesus, being prepared for our sake to go through the agony, the torture of the cross, tortured not only physically, but far more deeply and terribly, having to bear our sins and having to bear the anger, the righteous anger of your Father against human rebellion. And Lord Jesus, as the wages of sin is death, so you died. And yet it was the most purposeful death, and one for which we thank you with all our hearts today. And then we think of those short days after you'd been laid in the grave, and your glorious resurrection witnessed by something like 500 Christian people in the succeeding weeks, demonstrating that you have the keys of death and that death has no power over you eternally. And how we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've promised to all of us who come to you and trust you that we shall share in that great resurrection victory, that though our bodies here on earth are frail, and indeed will die, yet through your grace and love we shall be able to live with you forever. So our prayer, Lord Jesus, is that you will strengthen our faith and deepen our understanding of the gospel, that you'll bless us tonight and give us great joy in your presence and in the presence of each other as we worship you. We pray especially for those who are to be received into church membership tonight that you will give them great confidence and joyful courage as they take this step and as they seek to bear witness to you and your truth in the days ahead. And all these things we ask for your dear name's sake. Amen. Amen. Well, as you know, we have this special admission of uh, new members, and we look forward to that very much. And a particular word of welcome to those who have come along in support Uh, of the new members. Some of you, I guess, have come from some distance, and we're delighted to have you all here with us tonight. Trust that you will very much enjoy being here. I think we'll be serving our refreshments as usual downstairs, as far as we know, afterwards. Um, So do make your way downstairs to room five and enjoy uh, a fine cup of tea or coffee and uh, the company of friends old and new as uh, as we greet each other afterwards. Good. Well, we come now to our Bible reading, and perhaps you'd turn with me to the book of Judges in the Old Testament, chapter 17. 
Judges chapter 17, and you'll find this on page 216, page 216. I seem to have lost my notes for a moment. Just excuse me. I hope they're in my bag. <laughs> they might be in the Bible. I'll just test this again. <clears throat> Here we are. Here we are. <laughs> you. (laughs) Now, Judges 17 and 18, we're going to read that uh, tonight. But I want to say a little bit uh, about these two chapters by way of introduction first, because I hope that by doing so, the story itself will make a little bit more sense as I read it. Now, these two chapters in the book of Judges form one story. The central actors in the story are a man called Micah, who appears nowhere else in the Bible. He's not to be confused with the Micah who who wrote a a book of prophecy later on in the Bible. So we have Micah, who is a man of some substance, living in the hill country of Ephraim, and we meet his mother as well. We also have a young Levite from Bethlehem, whose name proves to be Jonathan, though we don't discover that until the end of the story. And then we have five spies and 600 warriors from the tribe of Dan. So we might call them Danites. Now, the story itself is not too difficult to follow, but the thing which is not immediately clear is how the reader is expected to evaluate the story. The comings and goings of Micah and Jonathan and these Danites, we have to ask, are these men behaving well or are they men behaving badly? And the answer is they are men behaving badly, even though they dress up their bad behavior in religious claptrap. Now, the author of Judges has been showing us over the previous 16 chapters how the people of Israel have come to be addicted to idolatry. Again and again, they abandon the Lord, their true God, and they begin to worship the fertility gods of the Canaanites. And the Lord chastises them by giving them over into the power of some pagan oppressor. They then cry to the Lord in their despair for help. He sends them a savior, one of the judges, to rescue them. So for 16 chapters, we've been looking at the work of these famous judges, Gideon and Deborah, Jephthah, Samson, and the others. But these final chapters of Judges, chapters 17 to 21, are very different, and they're a kind of appendix to the book, in which the author shows us what life was really like in Israel at ground level at this time. These five final chapters lift a curtain, as it were, on the very nasty things that were happening in the lives of individual Israelites like Micah and Jonathan and in the lives of whole tribes like the Danites. And the author of Judges is really saying to us, let me show you, for your instruction, dear readers, what life was really like in a corrupted Israel which had abandoned the true God. You may feel, dear reader, that you have to hold your nose, but this is the stinking mess that Israel got herself into. And, of course, there'll be lessons for us, for people of, uh, of God in later generations. Now, chapters 17 to 21 give us two stories, two tales of woe. The first is our passage for tonight, which is chapters 17 and 18, and the second story, which we'll look at, uh, I hope, next week and the week after, is told in chapters 19 to 21. So, friends, here we go, chapter 17, verse 1. Don't hold your nose, because we need to smell the rottenness of this undiluted There was a man of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, The 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse, and also spoke it in my ears, Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be my son by the Lord. And he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son, 
to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith, who made it into a carved image and a metal image. And it was in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and household gods, and ordained one of his sons who became his priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And this man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. And as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, Where do you come from? And he said to him, I'm a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm going to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, Stay with me, and be to me a father and a priest, and I will give you ten pieces of silver a year, and a suit of clothes, and your living. And the Levite went in. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah ordained the Levite, and the young man became his priest, and was in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will prosper me, because I have a Levite as priest. In those days there was no king in Israel. And in those days the tribe of the people of Dan was seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in. For until then no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. So the people of Dan sent five able men from the whole number of their tribe, from Zorah and from Eshtaol, to spy out the land and to explore it. And they said to them, Go and explore the land. And they came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. When they were by the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. And they turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What is your business here? And he said to them, Well, this is how Micah dealt with me. He's hired me, and I've become his priest. And they said to him, Inquire of God, please, that we may know whether the, the journey on which we are setting out will succeed. And the priest said to them, Go in peace. The journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. Then the five men departed and came to Laish, that's right up in the, in, in the far north of Israel, and saw the people who were there, how they lived in security after the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and unsuspecting, lacking nothing that is in the earth and possessing wealth, and how they were far from the Sidonians and had no dealings with anyone. And when they came back to their brothers at Zorah and Eshtaol, their brothers said to them, What do you report? They said, Arise, and let us go up against them, for we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. And will you do nothing? Do not be slow to go, to enter in and possess the land. As soon as you go, you will come to an unsuspecting people. The land is spacious, for God has given it into your hands, a place where there is no lack of anything that is in the earth. So six hundred men of the tribe of Dan, armed with weapons of war, set out from Zorah and Eshtaol and went up and encamped at kiriath Jearim in Judah. On this account, that place is called Mahanedan to this day. Behold, it is west of kiriath Jearim. And they passed on from there to the hill country of Ephraim, and came to the house of Micah. Then the five men who had gone to scout out the country of Laish said to their brothers, Do you know that in these houses there are an ephod, household gods, a carved image, and a metal image? Now, therefore, consider what you will do. And they turned aside there and came to the house of the young Levite at the home of Micah and asked him about his welfare. Now, the 600 men of the Danites, armed with their weapons of war, stood by the entrance of the gate. And the five men who had gone to scout out the land went up and entered and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, while the priest stood by the entrance of the gate with the 600 men armed with weapons of war. And when these went into Micah's house and took the, the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, the priest said to them, What are you doing? And they said to him, Keep quiet, 
put your hand on your mouth and come with us and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for you to be priest to the house of one man or to be priest to a tribe and a clan in Israel? And the priest's heart was glad. He took the ephod and the household gods and the carved image and went along with the people. So they turned and departed, putting the little ones and the livestock and the goods in front of them. When they had gone a distance from the home of Micah, the men who were in the houses near Micah's house were called out, and they overtook the people of Dan. And they shouted to the people of Dan, who turned around and said to Micah, What is the matter with you, that you come with such a company? And he said, You take my gods that I made, and the priest, and go away, and what have I left? How then do you ask me what is the matter with you? And the people of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows fall upon you, and you lose your life with the lives of your household. Then the people of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his home. But the people of Dan took what Micah had made, and the priest who belonged to him, and they came to Laish, to a people quiet and unsuspecting, and struck them with the edge of the sword, and burned the city with fire. And there was no deliverer, because it was far from Sidon, and they had no dealings with anyone. It was in the valley that belongs to Beth Rehob. Then they rebuilt the city and lived in it, and they named the city Dan, after the name of Dan, their ancestor, who was born to Israel. But the name of the city was Laish at the first. And the people of Dan set up the carved image for themselves, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set up Micah's carved image that he had made, as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. Amen. This is the word of the Lord, and may it be a blessing to us this evening. <clears throat> well, now we have a little pause while our offerings will be taken up, offerings to support the work of the gospel both here and further afield. And I think we'll have some music while that's happening. Thank you. together again. Dear God, our Father, you have been so generous to us, and you are generous to us, wonderfully so, day after day. And as we bring to you these gifts of money, which we want to offer for the support of gospel work, we want also to offer our lives 
everything that we are, our minds and bodies, such skills and talents as we have, we do want to ask you to take us and use us. Help us to be unashamed and bold as we seek to bear witness to the truth about you and about the Lord Jesus. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's turn in our hymn book now to number 158. 158. God, whose almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight, hear us, we humbly pray, and where the gospel day sheds not its glorious ray, let there be light, a prayer for light from the word of God. Number 158. <laughs> Well, do let's turn in our Bibles again to the book of Judges, chapters 17 and 18, page 216, 217. <clears throat> what I'd like to do in this sermon this evening is to look first at the rottenness in Israel as exemplified in our story, but then secondly at the remedy for Israel, rottenness first and then remedy. Let me give you a clue at this point. The remedy really comes in chapter 17, verse 6, and it's to do with a king, and that may give you an idea of where we're going to end up. So I think I can promise you a gloomy first part to the sermon, followed by, I hope, a more encouraging uh, final part to the sermon. Now, just one other preliminary point, and this is a point, a general point, about how the Bible instructs us. Very often, the Bible presents truth to us by saying, not this, but that. Let me give you one or two examples of what I mean. Here's an example from Jesus' teaching. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Not this, but that. And we understand the positive assertion much more clearly because it's contrasted with the negative opposite. Here's another example. When the Apostle Paul teaches Christian behavior, 
he will typically say, and he says more or less this in, in, in a passage in Ephesians, he'll typically say, don't live this way as the Gentiles do, with their minds darkened and their hearts hardened, but live a new lifestyle according to the mind of Christ. Don't lie, but tell the truth. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Here's another from the epistle to the Hebrews. Christ has entered not into holy places made by human hands, but into heaven itself. That's in Hebrews 9. And a little bit later in the same chapter, he did not offer himself repeatedly, but he has appeared once for all to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Do you see it? Not this, but that. It's a simple structure, but it's wonderfully clarifying because it helps us to see clearly where the Bible draws lines between truth and falsehood and between godliness and ungodliness. And we need both sides of the truth. We need the negatives just as much as the positives. We need the not this is just as much as the but that's. To use a phrase that Willie Philip I've heard use, we need the necessary negatives. If we just have the positives, we shall end up in hopeless vagueness. So, for example, if we're to understand the glorious positive truth that Jesus came to serve, we need to grasp the glorious negative truth that he did not come to be served. Now, in Judges 17 and 18, you won't find anywhere an explicit not this but that construction. But the whole story is presented in just this way. The author is saying to the readers, not this. Life lived as Micah and Jonathan and the Danites are living it is a stinking corruption of the glorious life of the true Israel. But, chapter 17, verse 6, if there had been a true and godly king in Israel at this point in history, there would not have been moral and spiritual anarchy with everybody doing just what they felt was right in their own eyes, imagining that they could make up the rules for themselves and plough their own furrow in whatever direction they chose. Well, friends, let's turn our eyes to the page and we'll look first at this rottenness and secondly at the remedy. Let's notice three aspects of the rottenness. First, these Israelites show a reckless contempt for God's law, a reckless contempt for God's law. You get the impression from the story that Micah is a middle-aged man, perhaps the master of a small estate in the hill country of Ephraim. Certainly, it's a big enough establishment to provide lodging for the five Danite spies in chapter 18, verse 2, and big enough for Jonathan, the young Levite, to have his own house as part of the, the setup in chapter 18, verse 15. So it was probably an extended farmstead. You'll find plenty of those in, in the countryside around us here uh, with, with several buildings standing close to each other. So if Micah was middle-aged, his mother was probably quite elderly. Now look at the conversation between them in chapter 7, verses 2, 3, and 4. It starts with a confession of theft. Now the Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not steal. But Micah says to his mother here in verse 2, The 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse and also spoke it in my ears, behold, the silver is with me, I took it. So he's confessing that he's broken the Eighth Commandment. Now the Ten Commandments also teach us to honor our fathers and our mothers, a commandment which is contradicted by a man who lifts 1,100 pieces of silver from under his elderly mother's mattress. Verse 2 does not speak of a parent-honoring relationship. On the contrary, it suggests a household where relationships have broken down rather badly. Now, Micah, having confessed his theft to his mother, gives the silver back to her in verse 3. And she then says something which will astonish anybody who knows the Ten Commandments. She says, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son, to make a carved image and a metal image. Was the old lady suffering from theological amnesia? I mean, she must have known the second of the Ten Commandments, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, and yet she not only organizes the making of a carved image, she has the gall to dedicate this artwork to the Lord. So what happens next? 
Well, verse 4, Micah returns the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. She then, having supposedly dedicated it to the Lord, puts 900 pieces back under her mattress and gives the 200 remaining to a silversmith who makes the idolatrous image. And the image is then set up in the household of Micah. Carved images, by the way, are horrible in the sight of God because they disastrously misrepresent him and distort him. To reduce the God who created 11 trillion trillion stars to the proportions of a little statue that you can put on your mantelpiece, a statue that can neither speak nor hear nor smell nor act, is a blasphemous misrepresentation. And it's a very short step from making a statue of God to the point where you think that this little godlet on your mantelpiece is rather like the genie in Aladdin's lamp. You rub the lamp, up comes the genie, just there to do your bidding, to bring you good luck, and to bless your work. And so the God who made the universe is domesticated. He's no longer awesome, no longer to be feared and served and loved. He's a kind of pet genie who says to you, your wish, sir, is my command. So Micah sets up the image in his house. But that's not all. Oh, no. Why limit yourself to a teaspoonful of religion if you can have a whole pint? Look at verse 5. Let's have a shrine as well, says Micah. A religious area in one corner of the house, perhaps the corner of the living room. And he says, let's have an ephod. That's a garment, like a tunic, which the priests of Aaron's line uh, were to wear. And he says, we'll have household gods. That phrase apparently could be translated, a whole house of gods. And let's have a real priest to put inside the ephod. So Micah carries out an ordination ceremony, and he ordains one of his own sons to be his priest. Now, you'll appreciate that all this behavior is totally out of order. We're still something like a century earlier than the days of David and Solomon. So there's no temple yet at Jerusalem. But the predecessor to the temple was completely in action, up and running. In fact, it's mentioned at chapter 18, verse 31. It's the house of God at Shiloh, the place where young Samuel served when he was a little boy. That was the place where the ark of the Lord was housed, and that was the place where the priests served at the altar. That was the place where people offering sacrifices should bring their sacrifice, as prescribed in the law of Moses. The law of Moses is very clear that Israel is to express her faith centrally at the house of the Lord, according to the regulations laid down in the book of Leviticus. And the priests were all to be drawn from just one tribe, the tribe of Levi. Micah was not uh, uh, of the tribe of Levi, and so for him to ordain his own son as if he were a a Levitical priest was to do exactly as verse 6 puts it. Everyone was doing what was right in his own eyes, not in the Lord's eyes. So Micah is running a coach and horses through the law of Moses from verse 2 to verse 5, and his mother and his young son are colluding with him. But that's not all. The story develops apace in verse 7. A young man just happens to turn up at Micah's house, and he is a Levite of the tribe of Levi from Bethlehem. He seems to be footloose and fancy free, and he's going wherever the wind blows him. Micah says to him in verse 9, where do you come from? Oh, he says, I'm a Levite from Bethlehem, and I'm happy to stay wherever I I can get board and lodging. A Levite? Oh, Micah's mind begins to work rather quickly. Maybe Micah is a little bit uneasy about having ordained his non-Levite son as a priest. So he says, in a kindly and generous kind of way, look, young man, stay with me and be my priest, and I'll give you a very good deal. Ten pieces of silver per annum, quite a lot. A new suit of clothes per annum. Many of us could do with that, couldn't we? And board and lodging. It's an offer that the young man simply can't refuse. Micah seems to be well off. The smells drifting from the kitchen suggest that Mrs. Micah is a good cook. So the young man goes into the house. And Micah, a dab hand by now at ordinations, ordains the young man. And the young man becomes like a son to him. And Micah says, rubbing his hands with glee in verse 13, Now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as my priest. 
Now let's just pause there to reflect on <clears throat> what is really going on. Micah and his mother and his son and this young Levite from Bethlehem are all recklessly transgressing the law of Moses in all sorts of ways. They're breaking the Ten Commandments blatantly. They're disregarding the teaching of Moses about priests and Levites and centralized worship in the house of God. And yet they don't seem to be aware of what they're doing. And they're using religious language. Blessed be my son by the Lord, says the old mother piously in verse 2. I dedicate the silver to the Lord, verse 3. How does she do it? By crashing her way through the Ten Commandments. It shows what can happen to people who have sprung from an environment of real faith, but have actually turned their hearts against the Lord. They can use the language of faith while denying the reality. I think of this in terms of us today. A family today could have real Bible-taught Christian faith in the parents' generation. Then in the second generation, because the, the children respect their parents and don't want to hurt them, you can have a pretense of Christianity involving the use of Christian language. But in the third generation, the family has descended into open agnosticism. Now, in Britain today, there are plenty of real Christians, thank God, and there are plenty of whole families of real Christians where the children and the grandchildren really trust and love the Lord. But there are also families where there's what you might call a family memory of Christianity, but no present reality of faith and commitment. And yet there can still be a certain amount of Christian language. Well, my granddad, yes, he was a minister in Drumna Drochet in the 1950s. And, you know, Christmas, wonderful, Christmas coming up. We would never miss going to carol service at Christmas time. It's just so lovely. The traditions, the candles, the crib, the mince pies, it's lovely. And, you know, we gave baby Archie a Bible at his baptism back in, in September. The language of Christianity, yet without the reality. Well, there's the first thing. Let's turn now from a reckless contempt of God's law to a second element in this picture of national breakdown, and that is a false perception of providence. Let's look at this first from Micah's point of view. Let's try and put ourselves in the shoes of Micah. Perhaps as Micah looks back over the years um, with hindsight after the events of chapter 17, he might say, <clears throat> how the Lord has blessed me. I'd stolen mother's silver, that's the truth, and she had cursed the thief, which was yours truly. And yet God blessed me so much through the confession of my sins. My mother forgave me, bless her little socks, and as a result her prayer life was renewed and her generosity to the Lord was opened up. Doesn't the Bible say God loves a cheerful giver? And her generosity it all led to the establishment of my shrine and my idol dedicated to the Lord. And what happened next? Was this a God incidence or what? The Lord sent me a Levite so that now I could have a real priest. Look again at verse 13. Now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as priest. Now let's look at this from the point of view of the Danite warriors as we go on into chapter 18. The Danites might have said as they looked back in later years. They might have said, it was wonderful, wonderful. Just like Moses sending the spies up into Canaan, we sent our spies up into the far north, up into Laish. But how kindly the Lord provided for us. Our spies, as it happened, took bed and breakfast at the house of Micah, and they recognized the voice of a young Levite there. Some God incidence that was. And he was a real priest. So our men asked him to seek God's guidance for, for their mission. And he came straight out with it. He said, verse 6, go in peace. The journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. Isn't God good? So our five boys, they went on northwards, found a wonderful stretch of country. I mean, the people who lived there were undefended and unsuspecting, ripe for the plucking, you might say. So our spies came back with a really good report. They said the land is very good. The people are unsuspecting. The land is spacious. For, verse 10, notice the language, God has given it into your hands. So we set off with an army of 600 people. 
The Lord blessed our every move. We called at Micah's house. We took his carved image, which would be a wonderful protector for us. And we persuaded the young priest to come with us. We said to him, verse 19, isn't it better for you to be priest to a whole tribe than just to one household? And the Lord put it into his heart to follow us. Now, Micah, of course, he was upset, but the interests of a whole tribe surely weigh more heavily than the interests of a single household. And when we got to Laish, it was as easy as falling off a log. The people put up no resistance. We burned the city down, but later we rebuilt it and we called it Dan. And we established the now very famous shrine of Dan, complete with carved image. And best provision of all, our priest was not just any old Levite. He turned out to be, verse 30, a descendant of Gershom, the son of Moses. If any migratory venture was ever blessed by the Lord, it was surely ours. Now, friends, you can see I've been speaking rather ironically but I've been speaking like that because the account itself is written with heavy irony. We're supposed to read it that way. The key to understanding what the author of Judges is saying comes in chapter 17, verse 6. Everyone was doing what was right in his own eyes. Now, that sentence is not ironic. That is the true view of things. That's God's view of things. So Micah and his mother and Jonathan, the so-called priest and the Danite warriors, despite their Lord this and Lord that language, they are religious anarchists. They're following simply their own plans and desires, and they're pretending to themselves that the Lord is blessing them and that they're following his will, while actually they're doing no such thing at all. Now, isn't this a warning to our own hearts? These chapters show us that it's possible to pretend to ourselves that we're following the Lord when in fact we're simply doing what is right in our own eyes. Let me give just one example of this kind of self-delusion, and I've come across this once or twice. It's possible for a Christian man to go through a rocky patch in his marriage. He tires of his wife, finds her difficult or irritable, assumes that it's all her fault, and while this is going on, he falls in love with another woman, a Christian woman. So he divorces his wife, and he persuades this other woman to marry him. And then he says, how the Lord has blessed me. I now have a wife that I get on really well with. But the man has just broken the commandment against adultery. The Lord hasn't blessed him. The man is reading his personal story through spectacles of self-deception. That's what Micah did. That's what the Danites were doing. But the true assessment of all these events is given us in that final sentence of chapter 17, verse 6. How then can we know if our conduct and our life is blessed by the Lord? How can we know that we're not deceiving ourselves? Surely the answer is by measuring our conduct against the standards that are taught here in the Bible. If we are learning to love the Lord and to love his ways as the Bible teaches them, of course he will bless us. Now, his blessing may include episodes of pain and difficulty, as it did in the, in the life of Joseph, for example, or the Apostle Paul, but we shall be under his providence. And at the end of our lives, we shall be able to trace the kind provisions of his guiding hand. Well, now, let's notice thirdly and very briefly how the actors in our story have a foolish reliance on the trappings of religion. This is one element in false religion, a foolish reliance on the trappings of religion. Micah wants something that he can touch with his hands and look at with his eyes. He wants a solid silver statue. And he wants a special place for his religious activities. So he makes himself a shrine. And he wants a human priest who will give him advice and guidance, who will inquire of the Lord for him when some important decision has to be made. He even wants an ephod, a richly embroidered garment, to dress his priest up in. And then you'll see, in the words of chapter 17, verse 10, then he can call him father, even though the priest is obviously a much younger man than Micah himself. When I was a Church of England vicar, sometimes I'd be taking funerals, 
quite often taking funerals, and always because regulations required it, I would be dressed up in my black and white Church of England robes. And sometimes the undertaker, thinking that he was being very correct, would call me Father. Would you like me to walk in front of the coffin, Father, or would you prefer me behind? What I would really prefer, Mr. Fotheringay, is that you wouldn't call me Father at all. I didn't say that, but I thought it. Now, this is human religion the world over. Something special to touch, somewhere special to go. You have your shrine, your special building. Someone special to do religion for you. And special clothes for your father and your priest to wear. Now, Christian people need none of these tangible things. Our father is in heaven. Our only priest is the Lord Jesus. We have no need of special buildings or statues or embroidered garments. And we can know the Lord for ourselves, each of us personally. It's him and us. We have access to him 24 hours a day wherever we are. Well, let's leave all that gruesome, rotten stuff behind us, the not this part of the message. And let's turn to the but that part of the message. And it's the but that part of the message that provides the remedy for all this religious corruption and rottenness. Chapter 17, verse 6 again. In those days, there was no king in Israel. The implication is that the author of Judges is writing in the days of the kings, quite possibly, quite probably, during the reign of David, a century or so after the period of the judges. The rule of David is bringing order and cohesion and a degree of godly discipline back into the land of Israel. Now, it was always God's purpose that his people should be ruled by a king. Way back in Genesis chapter 17, the Lord promised Abraham Abraham, that kings would be descended from him. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, the Lord tells Moses what kind of king the king of Israel should be when the time comes for a king. And his greatest quality in Deuteronomy 17 is that he should be a man who loves and reads and knows God's laws, so that he should be able to lead the people of Israel according to the law of Moses. The reason Samuel became upset when the people asked him for a king was that they were asking for the wrong kind of king, a king just like the kings of the Gentile nations, some petty tyrant who had no interest in leading the people by God's law and God's word. But a true king of Israel, a man after God's own heart, was exactly what the people needed. So the author of Judges here in chapter 17, verse 6, although he doesn't say much about the king, is clearly delighted that he is living in times when a godly king like David is preventing the situation where everyone can do whatever is right in his own eyes. These two chapters here in Judges are one of the most important passages in the whole of the Old Testament about false and corrupt religion, although they're not well-known chapters. And the answer they give to false religion is to have a true king whose authority channels the disciplined and lovely rule of God into the lives of the people so that they no longer do their own thing but learn to live their lives according to the life-giving word of God. It is simple, isn't it? And the application to our own situation is as plain as the nose on your face. We live in a society today where to a great degree, not entirely, but to a great degree, Everybody is doing what is right in their own eyes. What is truth to people who are not Christians? Now, that's an old question, isn't it? Because Pontius Pilate asked just that question when the truth in person was standing looking at him. But it's today's question as well. Many people today feel that it's impossible to grip any idea as being true in any final or absolute sense. In many areas of life, the goalposts haven't merely moved. They've been taken off the pitch altogether. The touchlines have gone too, and the penalty area. It's all gone, hasn't it? Now, this is obviously the case with sexual morality, but it creeps into almost everything. 
draining rapidly out of our society is the idea that two human beings can look each other in the eye and know that they share a common understanding of what is right and wrong in human behavior and thinking. And this is the consequence of relegating the Bible to the margins of our national life. Isn't it wonderful, then, that even though many people in Britain don't acknowledge him, Christian people rejoice in our king, our king being, of course, the Lord Jesus. To become a Christian, and many of you have been Christians for years, but some are quite new Christians, to become a Christian is to submit to the gracious and gentle rule of this king. To become a Christian is to leave that wilderness where there are no more goalposts and touchlines and penalty areas, and to take up residence in a realm of order, delight, and peace. We need discipline. Jesus is the good shepherd, and the good shepherd disciplines and rules and loves and cares for the sheep. We need a king because by nature we are anarchists, and anarchy leads to tears and despair in the end. Jesus, our king, also is willing to yoke himself to us. Take my yoke upon you. It's as though he, he and I are both oxen plowing under the same yoke. Take my yoke upon you, he says, and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's something definite, but it's light, it's delightful. Some of you are becoming members of this fellowship, this church, this evening. You already acknowledge Jesus as your king, but in joining yourselves to this particular band of pilgrims, you're committing yourselves in a more definite way to the joyful life of not only serving King Jesus, but of getting to know him better and better. That's what the Christian life is, is all about, getting to know him better and better. Let us, therefore, love our king, love him. Let us delight in our king. Let us listen to our king's voice as we read the Bible. Let's read the words of the Bible regularly and hungrily, like a hungry man sitting down to a very good dinner. Let's rejoice in the sheer goodness and kindness and mercy of the Son of God, whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. Let's rejoice that we no longer have the intolerable burden of trying to work out for ourselves what is right in our own eyes. We're freed from that now. We belong to a king who cares about us and who teaches us how to put one foot after the other. In those days, there was no king in Israel. But in our days, today, in our hearts, there is a king, Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God, our Savior and our joy. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we confess that there are indeed areas within our hearts and lives where we are still in rebellion against you, but our prayer is that you will more and more conquer our hearts with your wonderful love and kindness to us. Fill our minds and our thinking more and more, we pray, with the wonder, the greatness, the delightfulness and the glory that is you. And deepen in our hearts a hunger to know you better and better, we pray, that, that the marks of your lordship in our lives should be more and more seen and that others should be drawn to you. And we ask it to the honor and glory of your great name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing one more hymn before we have uh, the admission of new members, which includes some baptisms. Let's turn to number 488, 488. Heavenly hosts in ceaseless worship, holy, holy, holy cry. He who is, who was, and will be, God Almighty, Lord Most High. Number 488.
Well, now, we, uh, as you've heard, have a number of uh, friends who are joining us uh, this evening, and uh, I want to welcome them into our fellowship here. Indeed, we all do. And I'm going to introduce them uh, to you shortly. I think you have a list there of uh, some of our folk. That was prepared a little in advance, and um, one or two of our brothers are not able to be here. Hamid is not with us this evening, and uh, Farad and Morteza are stuck on a bus in Manchester. So uh, they will have to come back another time. But the rest of our friends are here, and uh, we're going to have, uh, first of all this evening, three uh, baptisms. Let me explain a little bit uh, about uh, what is, is going to happen this evening. The elders of our uh, fellowship here, uh, having satisfied themselves of the Christian profession and the Christian knowledge uh, of our brothers and sisters here, are very glad to give them opportunity to uh, make profession of their faith publicly in front of all of us, and of course in the presence of God himself. As they commit themselves, not only, as Edward said, to serve Christ, because many of them have been serving Christ for years, but to serve him here with us in company with the believers of this church. Now you'll see that uh, it's a diverse group, and that in itself is a testimony to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ that we've been hearing about this evening, of him who is king of all the peoples of this world, and who calls to himself those from every tribe and every people and every language to belong to his one true family, his true Israel, which now encompasses those from all the earth. As I've said, some are uh, professing faith for the first time today and are uh, seeking Christian baptism. Let me explain what that is all about. The sacrament, as we call it, of baptism was instituted by the Lord Jesus Christ himself after he had risen from the dead and just before he ascended to his Father in heaven. He said this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he is indeed the king who has come. Go therefore, said Jesus, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, these words of Jesus were to fulfill the words of the prophets of old. They had foretold a day when at last God's true king would come, at last through his Messiah. He would indeed do a new thing on earth through his new covenant, a covenant that would be everlasting, and that would draw people from every tribe and language and nation so that they too would rejoice along with the believing seed, the natural seed of Abraham, and become part of the true Israel of God, the one family of faith through Jesus Christ, a people who are cleansed and renewed and freed from their sins through the gospel of Christ, the Son of God. The prophet spoke of that day. Ezekiel said, In that day I will pour clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes. And so the sacrament of baptism is a sign and a seal of the fulfillment of God's covenant of grace, of our engrafting into Christ, of the forgiveness of sins at last that is real and permanent through the sprinkling of his precious blood. It's a testimony to our regeneration by the pouring out from heaven of his Holy Spirit, and of our adoption and of our resurrection at last to everlasting life. In other words, Christian baptism testifies to us that at last all the longings of that old era are over, all the longings for a true king, and therefore all the repetitive washings and sprinklings of the Old Testament temple that went on year after year after year, that all of these things have now finally been accomplished in the once and for all washing and cleansing through Jesus Christ himself. 
And so the book of Hebrews says, when Christ appeared, he entered once for all into the holy place, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will the blood of Christ purify our conscience from dead works to the living God? That's why the Apostle Peter says in his letter, baptism now saves you, not as the removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. It is Christ's appeal as the risen Savior and the great high priest that saves us because of his death for our sins and his resurrection for our justification. So baptism simply preaches to us visibly and wonderfully the true gospel. It says to us that everything God promised, he has now fulfilled once and for all in the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's a visible word that reminds us that in Christ alone our hope is found, that nothing else is needed, that nothing else is possible. No gods, no statutes, no special places, no special people. Just the grace of God poured out to us through the Lord Jesus Christ and poured out upon us as we believe by his Holy Spirit who brings us to newness of life through the proclamation of his gospel. And so, brothers, I'm going to ask you to step forward here. Come to the front here, all three of you. Now, most of it, you're coming first, okay. Just before I, I uh, baptize you, let me ask you all together, come, come here together, because I want, I want you to confess your faith in front of everybody. Now, we've been through this, so I, I know you know what I'm saying, even though I'm not doing it very well in Farsi. But do you confess God as your Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, and the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier? And do you repent of your sins with a humble heart and put your trust in the mercy of God, which is in Christ? Well, with great joy, therefore, brothers, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So, Mustafa, you first. Mustafa, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Now, Reza, you're next. Reb, you're here. Okay. Megrab, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Now, brother, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the blessing of God Almighty rest upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Our brothers, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. This is a day of great significance for you. And we know that for you to have trusted and believed and obeyed the Lord Jesus Christ means something very great and has cost you very dearly. And we rejoice and we're privileged to call you brothers. 
and we're glad to admit you into fellowship in our congregation here. Would you come along and stand at the front here so folks can, can see you? And let me introduce the others here who are uh, joining us uh, this evening in our fellowship. Where are we now? Amy, would you come forward? Amy Boardman. Amy is from uh, the very far south of England, from Dorset. Uh, she studied uh, economics and uh, international development at Bath University and then found her way up to Scotland. And she now works for uh, Matthew Algae, the coffee company in Glasgow, where she uh, advises them on sustainability projects. And uh, Amy, we're delighted to have you here with us in the fellowship and delighted that you're joining us uh, this evening. Gillian. Gillian Campbell is uh, a Glaswegian. She comes from Bears Den. She studied uh, at uh, the University of St. Andrews in her preclinical medicine and is now back here in Glasgow uh, continuing her med medical studies. And Gillian, we're delighted uh, to welcome you this evening too. Uh, Jamie. Jamie Dixon is a first year uh, law student here in Glasgow. He uh, is born and brought up. <laughs> they, make them, they make them tall in Aberdeen. But I can remember Jamie when he was just this size because he's the son of our very good friend, the Reverend Peter Dixon, who was preaching to us here uh, just a few weeks ago. So, Jamie, welcome. Myrid Dodds. Myrid is uh, uh, from Glasgow here and uh, has been a Christian for many years, but uh, more recently was finding it difficult to, uh, to travel uh, to the church where she uh, previously worshipped. She came uh, to our, our Ladies' Bible study in the morning here on Mondays and made many friends and then found her way into our fellowship here. And uh, Myrd, we're delighted that you've done so and delighted that you found a home here. Myrd has had a, a, a great involvement for many years in the land of Malawi. And uh, she's a great sower and uh, is engaged in sewing projects for Malawi and uh, is very keen to uh, recruit anybody who's a dab hand with a sewing machine. So if that's you, speak to Myrid afterwards, and she'll be delighted uh, to recruit you. Then uh, David, David Fleming. David's parents are from Glasgow, but he grew up down in England, and uh, doesn't sound terribly Glaswegian, but uh, we know he's got the genes that count. <laughs> David uh, has come back to Glasgow just uh, in this last year, having spent many years working in Scandinavia, working in Norway, and uh, has found fellowship with us here and a home. And David, we're delighted and we're very, very glad to welcome you uh, this evening. Then Rebecca. Rebecca Naismith is uh, from Edinburgh. Uh, she studied at St. Andrews University and then went back to Edinburgh, where she was uh, an apprentice at Charlotte Chapel Church there and was a student with us at Cornhill a few years ago. But uh, now she's moved through to Glasgow to do uh, teacher training and uh, has discovered that Glasgow's miles better. So <laughs> we're delighted, Rebecca. And uh, Julia has also done the same thing, moving through from Edinburgh to Glasgow. She is a current student uh, in the Cornhill training course. She works part-time as an architect in uh, Linlithgow and uh, has moved through to Glasgow this year. And uh, Julia, we're delighted to welcome you as well in into the life of the church here. <coughs> And last but certainly not least, Jim, uh, Jim Smith, who has uh, been coming along to Bible studies here at lunchtime, going back quite a number of years, I think, perhaps when Phil Copeland and Andy Baxter were first doing them, and uh, has become a regular here in our fellowship. And uh, Jim, we're delighted uh, to welcome you as well. So I'm going to come down and uh, stand in front of you all. And uh, I'm going to ask all of you to stand as well as a congregation because these vows of membership that I'm putting to all of our new members are the vows that all of us who are already members here uh, have taken at some time in the past. And every time we have new members joining us, it's not just them taking the vows, it's us reminding ourselves uh, of the covenant that we've made with the Lord and with one another uh, to serve him here. So we're standing uh, not just to support you, but to remind you that the things that you're affirming here are things that we all are affirming with you before God uh, and before everyone here. So let me ask, do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? 
Do you promise to join regularly with your fellow Christians in worship on the Lord's Day? Do you promise to be faithful in reading the Bible and in prayer? Do you promise to give a fitting proportion of your time and your talents and your money for the church's work in the world? And do you promise, depending on the grace of God, to confess Christ before men, to serve him in your daily work, and to walk in his ways all the days of your lives? Well, the Lord bless you and graciously enable you to fulfill and keep these promises. And the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory, confirm you by his Spirit that you may indeed be established in his covenant and be blameless on the day of the great appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. So since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. If anyone would come after me, said the Lord Jesus, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and the gospel will save it. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, help our brothers and sisters here before us this evening, we pray, to be faithful to these vows that they have made and help every one of us as a member of this fellowship of your people here likewise to be faithful and to keep one another faithful to our only sovereign, our only King, Jesus Christ, your Son. And so, Lord, as together tonight we rejoice in those who have come to join us we pray that you would use us by your grace and in your mercy to make the name of Jesus Christ known greatly and widely, that his words might be cherished, that his rule might be rejoiced in until the day of his great coming for which we long. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Now, as we close, let's say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.